It's good to be here. Thanks, Thanks for, coming. for having us. Thanks yeah. for coming, everyone. Um, yeah, so I thought it would be great for you to maybe give everybody a sense of like how Blend started and what Blend does, because I think that will become a good backdrop when we talk about red tape and how you overcame it. So why don't you give a little bit of background about the company? Sure, we, we were founded in 2012 uh, before the word FinTech existed. Uh, and actually the last three speakers in the main stage were Stripe, Robinhood, and Credit Karma. And so I think there's a big FinTech uh, renaissance happening right now, which is great, I think, for people's financial futures. Uh, but what the thing, the problem that we saw back then when we started the company was just how complex and opaque the home buying process is. And so we set out to go and fix that, to make it a simpler and more transparent process, not just for consumers, which I think is a big part of the puzzle, but we were coming off the tails of a big recession that was caused by the mortgage process. You know, 2008 was heavily, had something, had a lot to do with the mortgages that were given out there uh, prior to that in the 2000s. And so how do we make it simpler and more transparent for consumers, better experience for consumers, but then also have it be done more responsibly so that it's, the investors are getting a better loan, a higher quality loan, and they can continue to fund loans and basically create a lower friction economy for people. So uh, again, the, the name of this this panel, or this fireside, fireside chat is uh, is red tape. And I, I think of the two mantras of the entrepreneur are number one is move fast and break things because otherwise you'll never get something off the ground. And number two is, uh, I hate to say it, but fake it till you make it. So if you go into a client and you say, hey, I have precisely zero clients and I only have one week of funding left, what do you think? You want to sign up? They're going to say no. So what you would say is you project strength. You say, oh, I've got lots of clients. They're all over the place. And that's the fake it part until you make it. Neither one of those seems very, very well suited for financial su uh, services or medicine. Because you know, working with banks, and I, I run a payment company, working with banks is very, very difficult. You can't fake it till you make it. Um, and you certainly can't move fast and break things because you're talking about people's data, you're talking about actual transactions. So how do you think about you know, normal startup like photo sharing app for cats versus you know, financial services startup where you're working with, in your case, you know, banks which have both a lot of red tape but also have very, very high demands in terms of performance? Yeah, I mean, it's it, you know, at the end of his talk just now, Vlad said, you know, focus on something and do that thing really well. Unfortunately, with financial services, there's more overhead because there's the government and it's heavily regulated, and the space has a lot of things that you need to do to ensure that your customers are protected and the economy is protected. And so, in fintech, there's a lot more you have to do to do a good job. Um, so, I guess the first question I would say for us, the first decision that we were faced with was. Should we work with the existing uh, ecosystem, the banks, the lenders that are out there, or should we go and build a lender ourselves and do the lending ourselves? And in either case, by the way, there's a lot of regulation. If you're going to do your own lending, you have to do you have to deal with the regulators just as much as if you're going to partner with big regulated lenders. Um, and so the first question for us was, do we do that? And I, at the time, I mean, if you think about the home buying process, for us, it was. That's a really big decision in a, in a person's life, a financial decision. And as a consumer, you want to go somewhere that you really trust. And trust means a lot of things. Um, it could mean that you've been banking somewhere for 20 years and you want to get your mortgage with them. It could mean that you've seen the name a thousand times and your friends did it there and now you feel good about it. Um, but in a, in something as important as buying your home and moving into your next home or maybe raising a family there or whatever, you, you need to have that trust. And so. The two options were, should we build something ourselves and build that trust over time? And we thought that would be a really slow ramp and a lot of red tape with consumers, or we could partner with the existing ecosystem. There is one counter case to what I'm saying, which is Quicken Loans, which I don't know if you've heard of the Rocket Mortgage, but Quicken Loans created this massive market presence. They're probably the third largest lender by volume right now, but they piggybacked off of a trusted brand name. They licensed a name from one of the biggest, most valued names in America into it, uh, and built the Quicken brand off of that, and they're probably still paying for that license today. Um, and so anyways, long story short, we chose to go and work with the institutions knowing that there's a lot of red tape and knowing there's a lot of things that we have to do, uh, but knowing well that was also the right business strategy if we could overcome that red tape. Uh, so then the next choice was, do you go top down or bottom up? The, the, the short version of it is big banks, big financial institutions have a lot more process and a lot more rigor around what they ask you. They ask you for your financials, to his point. If you have one week of runway left, you know, they're not gonna, they, I think one thing that they look at, look at with us is, do we have the financial backing? Do we have the good backers that are gonna keep us around for a long time? 
And then when, when you think about, um, so it's not just bottom up or top down, like there, there's decision making within the organization. So it, it's funny, uh, at, at TrialPay, I would always call this the janitorial services problem, which is if you go to a massive organization and you say, hey, CEO, and you have an hour with the CEO, you somehow corner them and get their time, I can make your toilets 5% cleaner for 2% less money, like they're not going to care. Right. Um, so you kind of have to find the right person in the organization that actually cares about you enough to start working with you. So that's kind of like part one. But then there's, do you go to the smallest bank in the world, um, which might not give you that much credibility? Oh, everything okay? Yeah. Oh, microphone. I can hear you fine, but I guess you're right next to me. Um, do you go to the smallest bank in the world, which might give you credibility, and not just bank, this could be anything, like take any, any organization or any set of organizations. Do you go to the smallest guy, or do you go to the very, very large one? Because like in banking, you can go to JP Morgan, um, which is great, they're the biggest bank, or Wells Fargo, biggest bank, or do you go to the little guy down the street? Like where do you start? Um, and then kind of who within that organization do you try to determine, who, who can be your champion? And how do you determine that? Yeah, I mean, and I think it's probably different for different companies. In our case, I can speak to our case, it happened that the top 10 or 20 institutions in lending had an outsized impact on the entire economy. And, and by that I mean, they were the ones who were impacting Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They were the ones who were impacting the regulation. And it's because having 10% is more than 10 times as valuable to the economy as having 10 companies who have 1% each for a variety of reasons. But the short version is there's a whole bunch of different interconnections and there's a big network of money that's being moved around to make these things happen. Um, and so in the mortgage industry, it made a lot of sense to go and work with at least some of the big guys. Now, that doesn't preclude us. We work with small guys. We have two of the, the biggest guys and we have many of the smaller guys. And I think for us, it's really about figuring out the right way to get the most impact um, and so we chose, a, I would say, like a very, we're going to focus on the larger guys first and get that outsized impact and then use that to continue to go down and, and, and simplify our product as we go down market so that it can be easier, make it easier to adopt, et cetera. And then for finding the person within the organization, to your point about the janitor, you got to find somebody who, it's one of their top three problems that they're facing today. Um, you know, I get emails all the time from companies that are selling me marketing automation software. And it's not that I don't think marketing is an important part of our company, but I'm not the right audience for that query. Like, I'm just not the right audience for, for you to send that inquiry to and have me respond to it and engage in that discussion because if I'm doing a good job as a leader, I'm you know, sort of hopefully distributing responsibility appropriately and those people are the ones doing that. And so at the biggest organization, that's even more true because the CEO has 10,000 things on their plate and if you're not one of the top three things, they can't even talk to you. And so. I think for us, it's, it was really an art of figuring out who is that right person. We were very fortunate at the time that Rocket Mortgage launched in 2015, right when we were going to market. So it was very senior people in the organization who were engaged in, hey, we want to build a digital first experience for our customers. We want to have a digital first experience for our customers that any one of our customers can come in and work online and work with our bank in a new age, modern way. And so we ended up finding the right person for us, just so you guys know, is the head of mortgage. And that's usually somebody who reports the head of consumer lending, usually reports the CEO. And we've happened to map that out by going through hundreds of conversations with you know, the, the dozens and dozens of customers that we work with. So was Rocket Mortgage your very first customer? They were never, they were not a customer of ours. They were free marketing. But so who was, maybe talk us through like, who was your very, very first client and how did you get them and what was the biggest challenge that you dealt with, particularly from a, you know, uh, the guy, I always think of like in companies, there are blockers and then the blockers are like to take football, like they're trying to block you from actually scoring. Um, and then there are people that are allies. And in many cases, like at a large organization, business development, even though it's called business development, it consists almost entirely of blockers. Like, let me figure out a way to say no. Yeah. Oh, you know, you're, you're using, you're storing all the data in the cloud. I don't trust the cloud. The cloud is dangerous. But they'll come up with all sorts of crazy reasons to say no. So maybe walk us through that whole journey of how you got them end to end. Sure, um, it was the biggest challenges. It was a top ten lender. Um, they were heavily regulated, and they wanted to build. A, you know, they wanted to roll out a digital end-to-end -end experience. And this is probably, I would call it, I'll call it early product market fit days, which really to me is actually pre-product market fit. Um, this is three three plus years ago at this point. We were launched in 2012 for context, um, and. The organization, we had an unfair connection where we, were, we knew the chief risk officer of the organization from a long time ago, 
And uh, he said, you know, this is a really interesting concept. I don't know if we'll go for it, but why don't you meet with these people? And so he met with a few people. We had that helpful introduction by the chief risk officer, which I think was critical, because otherwise we had no credibility. Um, and then the interesting part happened where they were really interested in our product, and they wanted what we were doing, but that was just the start. Them, them agreeing that this was the right thing for their organization was about, I remember we were high-fiving, we were so excited, and we were like, we were still 12 months away from doing our first loan with them. And that was because that was just the start of the journey. Then we went to, through procurement, and when we were going through procurement, I remember this very vividly. They asked us, do you have your SOC 2? It's, it's an audit you know, terminology. And I remember I looked over at the guy who was in the room with me, uh, and we had no you idea. You, you had a SOC? We had, I was like, we had no idea what he was talking about, and we kind of left. And so but if we're, we were very fortunate that that person was like, hey, I will, I will be a a person who will help you and I'll handhold you through this process. And we sat in a room with him for three months straight and went through every aspect of getting our SOC 2, which is essentially an audit that tracks, um, you know, how, what are your policies around security? What are your policies around compliance, et cetera, so that you have everything documented so that a regulator could look at it and say, hey, you're doing a good job. Um, and I really appreciate, I mean, going, looking back, that was a huge moment for us because that packet, that information that we put together Every conversation in the future, the banks the, that we were working with in the future, they looked at us and that was now an, a, a weapon for us. We walked in with a packet full of information that represented how serious we were about regulatory compliance, information security, their data, being in the cloud. We, looked at all, we took all this stuff very seriously. And by the way, that also inspired us early on as a company to build those parts of the organization. Um, Going back to focus, I, it was something that, as much as it's nice to have, you know, a small, lean team do all these things. If you have a lot of boxes you need to check to get through things, and you, as the founder, don't want to have to focus all of your efforts on filling out a SOC two questionnaire, you know, we built a compliance team and a security team at our company very early on, so that knowing that that was such a big deal to this lender, it was going to be a big deal down the line. And so we spent a ton of an inordinate amount of time working through those problems. We were very fortunate to have that person walk us through it early on. And do you think you could bootstrap your way into that? Because the problem is that like at a very early stage company, you're either the one making the thing or you're the one selling the thing. Those are kind of the only two roles. And in fact, before you're ready to even sell the thing because you haven't made the thing, you only have one role, which is making the thing. And then if you think about organizations where you're selling into companies where there is a lot of red tape, there is kind of this third like compliance and legal. And you know, if you ever have an organization, I would I always, always joke about this at, at Visa. Now, Visa bought my company trial pay. And I think they had more lawyers than engineers. And if your lawyer to engineer ratio is over one, like that's probably a bad sign in terms right. of your ability to actually make things. So if you think about like, all right, imagine you have a million dollars in the bank. You just got your seed funding. You probably wouldn't have the resources to go do all of that. Like, how, how, do, you, how do you proceed? Because if you're going, or is it just not possible? You have to be pretty well funded if you're going and selling into an area, um, you know, whether medical or financial services, where you just need, like, the name of the game is compliance. I mean, the name of the game is compliance. Uh, I would say if you have a million dollars and you need to figure out where to spend it, it's going to be really difficult to go and sell to the big banks because it's going to cost you more than a million dollars all in to sell to that big bank. It just is. Unfortunately, that's just how expensive it is. Now, of course, the payout is great. They're paying you five, ten, twenty million dollars a year to license your services, but but it costs more than a million. So you can't go and build. But now that that being said, I don't think that early on when you are bootstrapping it that you shouldn't think about those things. I think think about those things build those things and sell them given the constraints that you have. If you have a million dollars and that's your constraint, go sell to the little banks. They'll walk you through the compliance stuff and they'll work with you on it. As long as you take it seriously and they feel that you're taking it seriously, they will work with you th through those problems because they want your product in their organization. They want the impact that you make for them to happen. And maybe most importantly, they want to feel like they're part of your journey. I know that sounds weird, but our best customers are the ones that feel like they're contributing to the company as much as the company is contributing to them. As in, they, it's like they had this idea that they wanted to build a payments company or a trading company or in our case a mortgage a, you know, lending company or whatever it is 
they wanted to build this 20 years ago. And I always hear these stories about, hey, in 2001, I tried to build this thing and I'm so glad somebody's doing it. Those are the ones who will become your champions. That's how you get in the door. You need somebody like that. Um, and it's, and I, I will, I'll just go back to the original point. It's not gonna be, with the big banks, it's not gonna be cheap to get in. It takes time and it takes effort and you have to have the runway to do it, which is, I think, kind of a little bit of a catch-22 because you as an investor, we talked about this you know, around our last, the timing of our last round, which was in 2015, you wanna see all the funding and the success from the big bank, or not the fund, I should say, the, the, the licensing fees from the big bank, but on the flip side, it takes 18 to 24 months to get a big bank ramped up with something. And so how do you then, as I'm curious to get your perspective as an investor, how do you balance those two things? How do you give them enough funding and runway to go and get those big banks and give them the benefit of the doubt while also making the right bets? Yeah, it's, it's tricky because we always want to see, ah, like there's infinite runway for this company and they have a rinse, wash, repeat model um, so that they can take their product and they can go sell it. One of the big dangers is when you go into a set of organizations where there is a lot of red tape and compliance issues, there's a lot of professional services, like think custom consulting work that you have to do. Um, so part of product market fit is the same product is fitting the same market, as opposed to it's not product market fit where you just have to keep changing your product and then you actually don't have one product, you have 100 products, you really have 100 clients and you're kind of like Accenture. And Accenture, last that I checked, is worth you know, 30 or $40 billion. So there's nothing wrong with being Accenture, but it's, it's not necessarily like a reproducible product if you get there. So when you think about, um, you know, if I think about what you do, the thing that really amazed me in terms of your journey to getting here is that you go to banks and you say, okay, I'm a brand new company and I'm gonna take uh, how much money people earn, like their bank balance information, all of the most confidential information that you could possibly imagine consumers giving up to banks, and you're gonna give it to me, and I'm gonna keep track of it. I'm also going to intermingle it. You know, This is what multi-tenancy means from a cloud perspective, so I have one database. I'm not gonna set up 50 different databases. Uh, I'm not gonna have anything on-premise. It's all gonna be in the cloud. And the cloud was actually, I mean, even though we all take it for granted now, I mean, there are plenty of banks that still today do not believe in it. They require everything actually be audited on premise. Like AWS is verboten for some financial institutions. You probably know this because Amazon will not let them actually send a representative into the floor of the data center, whereas Rackspace will. So that's a different topic. So how did you pull this off? I mean, it, it's so amazing to me, and I, I don't mean this to be like an infomercial for, for, for Neva and Blend, but I mean, you're, you're asking these financial institutions to give away the keys to their kingdom to a company that didn't exist you know, a year before, you know, when, when you launched, how, what was the hardest part about getting that off the ground? Or like, how did you get them to trust you? Yeah, I mean, one, I think we, again, we, going back to the first thing, we, we took compliance and information security more seriously than any company that they had ever seen that wasn't a 50-year-old, you know, technology company in the, in the finance space. Um, so we did take it very seriously, which I think helped a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, five years ago, there was nobody going into the cloud. In most of our customers, we are the first ever cloud vendor they work with. First ever. They don't use Salesforce, which is a much older, much bigger brand name. They don't use these other things. I think for, for us, it was about picking our battles. Not being on-premise, not being bespoke, uh, not having single-tenant architecture. Those are things that don't actually affect the security of the data, but they get, I feel like they get kind of bundled into the same thing by somebody who says, yeah, that's, it's less secure to do it that way. And I'm like, well, why? Actually, it's not. It's actually more secure to do it this way because we're going to apply the same security policies and build a huge security fortress around the things that we're storing. And it is really confidential and financial, you know, financial data of consumers. So it has to be something that we treat like it's a fortress. Uh, and the only way to do that is for us to build that with technology. I always say security is a technology problem for everybody. Um, and so we take it very seriously and we've, we, we stood our ground. I mean, yes, they could have said no, but our software creates a lot of value for them. And you know, we know that and they know that and we're really great partners for them on everything that doesn't that we don't hold as a, a, as a core principle, we work with them on. If they're like, hey, because of the disability laws, we need you to support, your, we need your app to be ADA compliant. This happened to us. One of the banks said, hey, we need your app to be ADA compliant. And 
we feel strongly about accessibility. That's one of the core principles of Blend. And so despite the fact that ADA compliance wasn't day one of our roadmap, we said, you know what? For you guys, we're going to move this up, and we're going to, but we're going to build this in a way that's used by all of our customers. We're not going to build it just for you. And that's turned out to be a great success. We're ADA compliant. We have lots of accessible users using our software today to get their loan, to get their mortgages. And it's, it made them look good to the DOJ. So it's a win-win. I mean, for us, it's a partnership model at the end of the day. And we stand our ground where it makes sense. And they sort of um, you know, sometimes are willing to work with us on those things, which is great. So uh, we talked about this earlier, but often in large organizations, you have this kind of uh, this system that unfolds, which is nobody can say yes, but anybody can say no. And that's what often makes it very, very hard to get the deal done. So you might even find the right person in the organization who it is one of their top three priorities, but then the security person that uh, has never heard of the cloud says, no, no, I don't want to do this. And they don't have the ability, again, to say yes, but they do have the ability to say no. I mean, maybe walk us through, like, um, you probably had an early blocker in your history that you encountered that almost derailed things. And how did, how did you overcome that? Yeah, there was a time when, um, I think this was our second customer, one day I woke up to an email saying, hey, we're shutting off all access to Blend. And, and I was thinking to myself, first of all, why? And second of all, could we have known that this was coming? And it turns out that somebody at that organization didn't realize that there was customer data in Blend. And so that person found out, this is somebody who was nowhere near the project, found out and said, we've got to shut off all access to Blend. Um, and the only thing you can do there is be extremely cooperative. I mean, obviously, I called some people and I called our sponsors there. And by the way, this go going back to the concept of having somebody who wants to live your journey with you, the journey of your company and help your company, the first person I called was that person. I call them a champion, you know, you call them whatever you want, but calling that champion and having that person give us advice on how to cooperate best was critical because if we didn't have that, we would have just been flying blind. Um, but I got some good guidance on that. The champion guided us through this and we were able to work with them to quickly get it resolved. I mean, quickly, I mean a matter of a couple weeks. But that stuff for a company that's trying to move quickly, which we are trying to move quickly despite all the red tape, is gonna happen, and so I think for us it was just about being very mature about it and being very open and transparent with them about everything, because if they find something that you didn't tell them afterwards or they ask you a question, you give them a misleading answer, you can't do that, you can't fake it in this world. They're gonna find out and then you're gonna get in a lot of trouble, whether it's by them or by the government. So we worked very closely with them and we just worked through it. it took us a few weeks, but it was definitely a stressful time. And when do you know kind of when to fight and when to hold? So I'll give you one example from my experience. There is a, they'll remain nameless, but a large financial institution. We were working with them, and then uh, they thought that PHP, Python, and C were dangerous programming languages. I assume the middle was dangerous because it actually could strangle you, and something bad could happen if you're using Python. Right. right. And it was just so absurd. But, um, and you know, we, we fought about this and went back and forth, and it just like it was clear the guy just wasn't it just wasn't well informed. But if you go and kind of attack head on and say no, you're an idiot. Python is not a snake. It is a snake, but it's also a programming language that's used by millions of people. You make him look like an idiot, then he might not want to work with you. Or you could go say, all right, fine, I really want this client. I'm going to recode everything in Java, which is what they wanted. Um, we we stood our ground there and eventually kind of got things got things going in the right direction, although that guy still thinks that PHP, Python, and C are dangerous. Um, so you, you must have run into situations sure, yeah. like this. Like, when, when do you kind of like fold and give in to client pressure? Because that's the hard thing is that you see, okay, wow, I really, if I get this biggest bank in the world, if, if Wells Fargo says tomorrow, uh, I will go with you and replace my internal system, but you have to do X, Y, and Z, where X, Y, and Z are totally orthogonal to what you're thinking about doing. Like, when do you, when do you adapt? What posture do you adapt? Yeah, I guess part of it is figuring out what principles you have, and one principle that I would have is I'm not going to rewrite my entire programming language, you know, to be, to fit what you think is secure. So I, I think I would almost reframe the question that they're asking you and say, this is, we've done this a lot of times, because they'll, a lot of times they'll say, well, we don't think that, you know, the cloud is, or multi-tenancy or whatever is secure. And I don't say, I don't try to fight them on that ground, because that's almost a religious argument in some ways. It's like, what is the cloud, and what defi who defines what the cloud is, and what's, what's secure? And I say, Actually, what I say is, what is your security checklist? What do you look for in security? What do you look for in a programming language? And we can, if we can't achieve all those things that check all those boxes, we will, we will make it happen or we'll switch to your way. And so a lot of times it's about getting their, um, 
getting their definition of why they want the, you to get out of the cloud or to switch programming languages and the, 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 the thing behind it. And if you can get them to articulate that, which is often like they believe that you know, peep things running on Python in Python could, you know, infect the system and create a virus that destroy things. And you're like, well, no, that's actually not. And here's, here's why. And here's all the descriptions of it. And, and, and here's why Python is a secure language or whatever it is. In our case, here's why, you know, having customer data in this cloud actually is fine. And here's why the security, here's all the security controls that are in place that match your security guidelines that you have internally for your own systems. And so we act, almost turn the question on them and say, okay, what do you look for in security and not fight them on the religion. She reminded me of one other thing, which is replacing internal systems. Uh, one of the hardest things to do in terms of overcoming red tape is to get a bank or a health care company or wherever it is to replace an entire internal system. And the reason for that is pretty obvious. There's 100 people who are like, A, they've built this thing over 50 years. B, they've spent a ton of time and money in it, and it has 300 times the complexity of the simple system that you've, you've built and handles 50 times the, the number of cases that, that you can handle as a, as a company at your stage. And so I would say that strategy of replacing internal systems, if you're going to go into a bank, I would say try to work with what's there wherever you can, or a healthcare company. We work with what's there. We don't go to you and say, replace everything with Blend and you'll run. We work with what's there. We, com we conform to the common standards and we get you up and running in a matter of weeks. And that's a really strong part of our selling proposition over replacing what's there. Oh, because a lot of that goes into when you first approach a large organization, especially a large organization prone to lots of red tape, there's build versus buy versus partner. Um, the larger and more regulated the company, the, li the less likely it is that they just go make an acquisition because they don't really understand technology. That's one of the reasons why they're partnering with tech companies to begin with. But they often have this kind of knee jerk, like we can build this, um, I mean, Chase famously has tens of thousands of engineers that work there, and they think that they can build the iPhone or something. So th there's, um, you know, how do you how do you try to navigate towards the right? Because you obviously don't want them to build. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe you do want them to buy your company, but but you really want them to kind of say, okay, our internal building failed. Um, now it's time to partner. Um, because if you just give them the idea and they say, ah, we're going to go build this, you might have to come back three years later. And then they failed on their internal quest, their somewhat quixotic adventure to go build the thing, and then now they're ready to partner. And I'm sure you've dealt with this a lot. Where oh, sure. I'm going to build my best. I'm going to build the best online mortgage experience ever. Six years later, on $100 million down the tube, it still doesn't work, and then they come back to you. But you have to know when to approach them. Right. And, and by the way, you're never going to force timing with these guys. If they're convinced 100% that they're going to build it, there's plenty of financial institutions out there. You don't have to focus all your energies on convincing them, even if they're wrong. Being right is not valuable. You know, it's just not worth the fight. So I'm going to end, because this will kind of be a good, I guess, commercial for why it's important now to get into fintech if you're not, or even healthcare tech. There is more momentum behind partnering now than there ever has been before. Uh, even the traditional fintechs, the lending clubs, the Ondex of the world that you heard of in the previous generation, their focus is on partnering, and the banks are very open to it now. And the big reason that they're open to it now is, one, they see the acceleration that's happening outside of their walls, which is huge. If you're getting outpaced by a, a fintech, then you want to work with them to get the same acceleration. Two, I think it's a it, long term, it's a existential risk. Uh, and three, to your point, they've been burned building these things. These things, I mean, they're expensive enough for us to build with very little um, overhead. They're really hard for a bank to build, and so they've been burned. Now is the time. If you want, if you're thinking of building a fintech startup or a healthcare tech startup, I highly recommend now is the time to start thinking about how you can partner with those guys because I've never, in the 10 years we've been doing this, I've never felt more of a willingness to partner than today. All right, well great, well we're out of time, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone.